my name is Thomas. This evening, we'll enjoy a relaxing stroll through the grounds and gardens of Oxford. We may even uncover some of the mysteries hidden behind the ancient stone walls of this timeless place. Let's take a moment to settle into bed first. Go ahead and close your eyes. Adjust your body until you find a comfortable resting position. Take a few deep breaths and allow yourself to slow down. You have nothing to worry about or care for right now. So give your mind permission to drift with my voice to the pathways of Oxford and eventually to sleep. The smell of leaves, soil and ancient stone permeates the air. You breathe in deeply. It's a misty autumn day in Oxford. Grey and damp, but beautiful beyond words. They call this town the Dreaming Spires. And that's exactly how it feels. The buildings themselves are suspended in a dream softly shifting, yet always the same. Oxford is full of mysterious doors, entrances and portals. Everywhere you go, you catch glimpses through iron railings or through a heavy wooden door as it swings shut. These passageways lead to chapels and libraries gardens and quadrangles. Sometimes it seems as though they could take you to another world. You often dream about these other worlds and what lies on the other side. The doors of Oxford are almost always closed or half ajar, revealing a sandwich board sign that says closed to visitors. You stop by the entrance of the college that has always intrigued you. It's a castle by the river that was built more than 500 years ago. There's a tower the colour of sand where the choir comes to sing at dawn in May and a huge garden stretching along the river. It's always struck you as one of the most beautiful places in a town that's dripping in beauty. Today, you're in luck. The oak door is wide open and the sign reads, open to visitors. It's the first time you've ever seen it open. As you stand by the doorway, you can smell the wet leaves in the quad mingled with the warm, toasty smell of the porter's coffee inviting you in. You step over the threshold and greet the porter. He's a jolly-looking old man who sits in his office watching students and visitors come and go. His room looks small but cosy, filled with books and keys and decorated with college photos. Through the window, you can see black and white photos of students from years gone by, posing in their academic gowns. If they weren't black and white, the photos could have been taken today. So little changes in Oxford. The porter looks up from his newspaper 
and nods his approval. You can enter. You find yourself in a peaceful, cobbled courtyard, one of many quads. There are no other people here, only a couple of pigeons pattering across the stones. They coo and scatter as you approach, fluttering high into the branches of a tree with russet red leaves. The trees are even more vivid in the light of the autumn afternoon. They're like flickering flames or tattered scarlet flags rustling in the wind. You know you're not allowed to walk on the lawn and you wouldn't want to spoil its perfection anyway. It's immaculate, a flawless square of verdant green. You stand at the edge and breathe in, smelling the deep, damp, earthy smell that momentarily transports you to somewhere wilder. Closing your eyes, you could almost be in the woods. It rained this morning, and the scent permeates the atmosphere. The air still feels wet, somehow. It's wonderfully fresh. You wonder about the college grounds. Rumours tell about a deer park. Could there be woods nearby? Two young women emerge from an archway on the far side of the quad, deep in hushed conversation. You watch them, catching the occasional word as they pass by. Names of ancient authors and mention of a tutorial. They must be classics students. You think back to the past, recalling other names. Seneca, Sophocles, Aristophanes, Cicero, Sappho. The words turn into a kind of mantra, circling around your mind as you cross the quad to reach another courtyard. You find a peaceful square of grass and greenery, encircled by a covered walkway. This place is called the Cloister, and it reminds you of a garden in a monastery. You listen to the echo of your footsteps on the flagstones. How many people have walked here over the centuries? The cloister is one of the oldest parts of the college, built in medieval times. Glancing through one of the countless arched windows, you can see another pristine lawn. If you look closely, you can see the statues too. A sphinx, a pelican, a lion, and a solemn little prince, to name a few. You glance at a sign on the wall. It says that these strange little statues are known as hieroglyphs. Some are allegories for scholarly subjects, while others represent virtues. The Sphinx is actually a legendary creature from Persian mythology called a manticore. It represents pride. The pelican stands for paternal affection. You could spend all day here admiring endless architectural details, designed to puzzle, inspire, and delight. Distant voices echo down the hallways, students chatting on their way to the library, perhaps, or professors sharing ideas and theories. Everyone speaks quietly, as if in respect for a sacred place yet their voices are carried through the stone. 
This place feels impossibly old, yet timeless. One hundred years from now, you imagine it will still be the same. Voices travelling through the centuries, murmuring in hushed tones about art, science, philosophy, literature. The eternal beauty of a love of learning and the exchange of knowledge. Then the singing begins, quiet at first, a soft melody that could just be in your imagination, but then it grows, and one voice is joined by others, rising and falling, then reaching a climax. They pause, one voice carries on, singing alone. The organ and the rest of the choir join in lush, swelling accompaniment. They could be singing in any time and in any language. You turn towards the sound of the music. You're standing by the door of the chapel, where the college choir has gathered for afternoon practice. As you linger by the door, listening, you lose track of time. You close your eyes. The music seems somehow familiar, even though you're sure you've never heard it before. As you listen, you feel the surge of the music within you. It falls in sync with your own breath. Time stops, and you're aware of nothing but yourself and the golden, spiraling melody. Music has a unique, mystical power. It transcends time, place, language, and faith. The sweetness of certain sounds is universal, like the appreciation for the beauty of birdsong. Some people believe that early humans communicated through song, before developing speech. Mothers sing to their babies and mimic songs through their speech patterns. Music has a universal magic, you think. Your eyes are still closed, yet as the voices soar, you can see golden light behind your eyelids. Synesthesia, a phenomenon where two senses are connected, often in mysterious, inexplicable ways. You hear a name and taste fruit. You see the person you love and experience a cloud of scent and colour. Or, like right now, you listen to a choir and see gold. The voices fall and fade into silence. The gold softens into sand, the very colour of the walls. You open your eyes. You could stay there longer, waiting for the choir to sing again, but there's so much more you want to see. You can always come back later. The corridors of the cloister are lined with doors and steep, narrow staircases that might lead to bedrooms or offices. You'd like to explore, imagining cosy, wood-panelled rooms with thick carpets, comfy armchairs and bookshelves. You're starting to feel a little sleepy. You think how nice it would be to have your very own room here. 
you could settle into a chair with a cup of tea and a book reading until the daylight fades and slowly drifting into sleep. Then you recall the deer park. You'd love to see it while it's still light and before it begins to rain. You peer through the arched windows of the cloister to look at the grey sky, gradually becoming darker and heavier. The weather is unpredictable here, with the clouds constantly shifting. It's just a matter of time before the drizzle arrives. You want to find the gardens, but you're not sure where to look. You don't have a map, and all the doors seem to lead to staircases. You're about to retrace your steps and ask the porter when you catch sight of a young woman coming down the steps of a nearby staircase. You ask if she can direct you to the deer park. The young woman introduces herself as Harriet. She's on her way to a tutorial near the grove so she can show you the way. It's no problem, she's early anyway, and she'd be happy to give you a tour. Harriet says she'll take you the long way round, so you can see the river and some other beautiful parts of the college. As you walk together, your steps echoing down the corridor, she tells you a bit about herself. She's in her second year, studying English literature. She's very happy here. While all the colleges are beautiful in their own way, this one is special. She feels closer to nature as her bedroom has a wonderful view of the grounds. She often goes for long walks in the woods. Her favourite walk takes her beyond the college grounds to the open countryside. There are winding paths and tall trees that remind her of a fairy tale. Harriet likes to explore other colleges and learn about their traditions. You're curious to know more. You ask her if there are any unusual traditions or rituals as you walk beside the river, beneath the darkening sky, she tells you all about her personal favourite, the tortoise fair. In the summer, representatives of different colleges gather in the gardens of Corpus Christi. The tortoises amble across the grass as the crowd cheers them on. The winner is the first tortoise to reach the lettuce. Then, there's the time ceremony at Merton, perhaps the strangest of all Oxford traditions. She's never seen it herself, as it's a secret ceremony reserved for members of the college. Students meet at the sundial on the lawn in the quad at two o'clock in the morning wearing their academic gowns. They then walk backwards around the quad for the next hour, going round and round in backward circles. But why? Harriet says she has no idea why, or even if it's a real tradition. Oxford is full of mysteries. You pass through a grand courtyard lined by an elegant neoclassical building. It's hard to imagine that ordinary people live, work and study here. It's like something out of a novel or a period drama. You can picture a horse and carriage, lords and ladies arriving for a ball. 
You once had a dream where you were a guest at a house just like this one on a warm summer's day. Harriet points at something in the distance. There are the deer. You can see them ambling through the trees. Harriet has to leave for her tutorial. You breathe it in, letting it take you back to memories of previous autumns. You close your eyes and feel the air filling your lungs. It's fresh, healthy air. And you feel at peace. If it wasn't about to rain, you would stay here, lingering in the autumn air. You open your eyes and see that there are even more deer. You try to count them. Twelve, you think, though there may even be others beyond the trees and out of sight. They're smaller than you'd expected and most appear to be female. Deer have always been one of your favourite animals. They're graceful creatures, appearing in countless myths and legends. Buddha is often depicted with a pair of deer, and was said to have been reincarnated as a golden deer. In Japanese Shintoism, the deer is the messenger of the gods, and Artemis, the Greek goddess of the hunt and the wilderness, is always accompanied by a deer in statues and paintings. Then there's the white stag, a symbol of purity, mysticism, and the other world. It represents spiritual quests and the unattainable. The branch-like antlers of the stag are admired across the world, not just as a symbol of strength, but also rebirth and regeneration. Every winter, the stag sheds its antlers. They grow again in the spring, bigger and stronger than before. You can tell the age of a stag by the size of its antlers. These deer are small, delicate creatures. There are only two or three stags grazing in the distance. Their antlers look modest compared to the majestic pictures you've seen. As you were watching the stags, a doe silently approached. You turn to your left and see that she's just a couple of meters away from you. You can hear her quiet, muffled breaths as she watches you with something like curiosity. She's looking at you with large, dark, quivering eyes. You look back, and for a few spellbinding seconds, you're connected. It's a rare privilege to be so close to a wild animal. You were so transfixed by the deer that you didn't notice the rain. It's a light drizzle, more of a mist than a shower but you don't have an umbrella, and besides, it's getting a little chilly. You'd like to find somewhere warm to sit and rest your feet. Remembering the way you walked with Harriet, you decide to retrace your steps. Through the deer park, past the neoclassical building, along the river, it's utterly silent, except for the sound of your footsteps crunching on the gravel, and the occasional caw of a bird. 
It's the time of day when most students are deep in their studies, or chatting with a friend over a cup of tea in their rooms. Back in the cloister, you see a sign that you didn't notice before. Old Library, it reads. The name conjures up images of wooden beams and endless shelves of beautiful books, their spines gleaming in the light of a lamp. It's tempting. You climb the narrow steps, holding on to a walked handrail for balance. They're surprisingly steep. A sign on the wall says, To the Library. Around the sign, you can just about make out the names carved on the wall. You know that many famous politicians, scientists, and writers have studied here over the centuries. You look carefully to see if you can recognize any, but the light is dim and many of the names have faded with age. You imagine someone standing on this very step three or four hundred years ago, carefully carving their name. Although such behaviour would be frowned upon today, it's nice to have a reminder of the past. Just like the music of the choir and the conversation about ancient writers you overheard, it's a symbol of unity. Everything is connected. You continue to climb, one step, then another, then another. Eventually, you see the door. It's heavy and wooden, cracked and scarred by time. You can tell it's going to creak before you even touch it. Then, you turn the handle, and sure enough, you were right. You find yourself in the solemn hush of the old library. You breathe in the scent you would recognize anywhere, even with your eyes closed. In a way, it's as warm and comforting as the smell of bread in the oven. It fills your lungs and goes to your head, filling you with a deep sense of comfort and contentment, the smell of old books. From where you're standing, you can only see a fraction of them, shelves upon shelves stretching all the way to the far end of the room. It's not a particularly large room, yet the bookshelves create a double illusion. Somehow, they make the room seem both smaller and endless. You could keep walking and walking, always finding more books to discover. A stroll into antiquity, place that makes you move slowly, dreamily, as if walking underwater. You press your face to the glass, which is streaked with raindrops. The soft vibrations created by the rain spread through the window to your cheeks. A soft, lulling rhythm. Beyond the misty haze, you can see the cloister, the manticore and pelican look like smudges from here. It wasn't that long ago, but your walk through the cloister already feels like a dream from ancient history. You return to the shelves, skimming titles. Many are in Latin on this particular aisle. The names are beautiful but you can't make sense of them. 
Perhaps there are some books in English on the other side of the room. Could there even be a copy of that story you used to love? You haven't read it for many years. The thought stirs something in you and you slowly cross the room to search for it. Names, familiar and unfamiliar, dance before your eyes. You gaze at the bookshelf, drifting up, down and side to side. Then you see it, the golden spine of the book you love. You run your finger along it, then gently ease the book from its position on the shelf. You open the cover, breathing in deeply. It's the familiar musty scent of the other books in the library, but there's something else too. It could be floral, maybe someone pressed flowers between the pages. You look up and see a plush armchair right by the window, calling your name. You settle into it, making yourself comfortable. With the window behind you, you can hear the gentle pitter-patter of the rain, like a lullaby. You turn to the first page and begin to read. It's so familiar, you could almost recite it from memory. It's all coming back to you. Your eyes drift, closing for a moment. The rhythmic patter of the rain surrounds you, lulling you deeper into relaxation. The words echo softly through your consciousness, slowly losing their meaning. They're only sounds, like the falling rain. You find yourself drifting deeper and deeper. The light behind your eyes fades and softens. The words fall silent, replaced by the steady rhythm of your breath. Your mind continues to wander along the mysterious paths and staircases of Oxford, leading you into a pleasant dream.